Welcome to the Pfeffer on Power podcast. I'm your host, Jeffrey Pfeffer, a professor at Stanford University's Graduate School of Business and author of 16 books on a range of topics, including the topic of my oversubscribed MBA class and this podcast, Power. Every other week, I talk to someone about their path to power and provide you with practical guidance about how to accelerate your career. Today's guest is the famous and inimitable Steve Wesley. I have known Steve since he took my class when he was a graduate of Stanford Business School in 1983. Steve has worked in both the public and the private sector. He is probably best known for being employee number 22 at eBay doing business development. He also was elected to the office of the controller for the state of California, where he was basically the chief financial officer for the enormous economy of the state of California, sat on, I think, close to a thousand or maybe more than a thousand boards and commissions. He ran for governor. He ran for the Democratic nomination for governor. While he was controller, he worked with the famous Arnold Schwarzenegger. Some years ago, he formed the Wesley Fund, and the Wesley Fund is a venture capital fund that invests in alternative energy and in technologies that make alternative energy possible. I was actually an investor in Wesley Fund, too. He is a fabulously good friend of mine, and he has also now started an institute that is trying to change policy in the state of California. So he is a man of both public and private interests. Welcome to the show, Steve. Jeff, I'm delighted to be here. So our topic, every time I, when I have a guest on, I try to have a specific theme. The theme for this show is you, your observations about the similarities and differences in power in the private and public sector. But before we get into that, give the listeners who aren't as familiar with you as I am, and so notwithstanding my little brief introduction, give the listeners a sense of how and why you have spent time particularly in the public sector, but also in the private. Well, as you know, I do a session in my class in which I encourage students to get into politics, to get into public service. Many of them don't do that. So I think one of the interesting aspects of your career has been your devotion to public service and public policy mixed in with your time in private industry. Could you explain a little bit about that evolution? It's a, a, a fascinating question because, Jeff, as you know, and I also teach at the Graduate School of Business as a, a lecture, we've got the best and brightest students in the world at Stanford's Graduate School of Business, but precious few of them are willing, prepared to take the jump to run for public service. And at precisely the time in world history when the United States and, frankly, most countries are crying out for smart people to run cities, states, and countries in an ethical way. Fewer and fewer, I would argue, the best and brightest are stepping forward to do that. And we need to figure out smart ways to change that. What made me step forward? God knows. I, you know, I grew up in the waspiest family ever. I was a public school kid who grew up in the suburbs. My dad was a beer salesman. And all he wanted me to do, because he'd been in the Depression and fought in World War II, is to get a kid who get a job. Back in those days, just getting a job was winning. And I remember him saying, uh, what are you going to major in? You got into Stanford. Most amazing thing ever. What are you going to study? I hope it's accounting or dentistry or something. You got a job. But I said, I'm going to be a, I want to be a history major, dad. And he said, he had two words uh, or three words. He said, throw in your life away, throw in your life away. Who's going to hire a history major? What are you thinking? This place ain't cheap. But I was driven to be in public office, I'd always been fascinated by it. God knows why. Both parents are Republicans. I was a Democrat. Nobody in our family had ever run for public office. I was driven to it. I think part of it may have been the Times, Vietnam War, Civil Rights Movement, Arms Control, a guy named Paul Ehrlich in a book called The Population Bomb. There was a lot going on then. And to me, it was irresistible. I cared a lot about changing the world. That didn't bother me a bit that you wouldn't make much money doing that. So I majored in history. I was lucky enough to be a student body president at Stanford. 
When I graduated from Stanford University as an undergrad, I made a beeline to Washington, D.C. I worked at the Department of Energy in the Office of Conservation and Solar. Today, that sounds prescient. Back then, people thought I was an idiot. Uh, Conservation and solar, no one was buying that stuff. Solar was $78 a watt to produce when I worked in the Carter administration in the very first Department of Energy. And if you're wondering, gosh, is that in the money or out of the money? Uh, today, you can buy solar for about 20 cents a watt. So it wasn't selling. The good news is I realized I needed a plan B. I came back. I got my MBA at Stanford. I was lucky enough to take Jeffrey Pfeffer's course, which was one of the best classes I'd ever taken, most entertaining for sure. And frankly, one of the few things from business school that served me well throughout the rest of my life. That's a great answer. Thank you. So one of the themes that I wanted to pursue with you is, in fact, the similarities and differences between power, as you've seen it play out, and the public and private sector. You have been associated with some of the biggest characters, if I can use that word, in kind of modern history. Arnold Schwarzenegger. You worked with Arnold, the Terminator. Fortunately, he didn't terminate you. And many people I know in your party were concerned that you, in fact, had formed a bond with him. And they thought that was like disloyal for a Democrat to work with Arnold. You worked with Meg Whitman, who did run for governor, by the way, was quite unsuccessful in her campaign, the CEO of eBay. You have worked in the city of San Jose. You have a venture capital firm. You were on the board of Tesla and the famous Elon Musk. So you have seen some of the most amazingly huge characters of the modern world. Tell us what you have learned about power from watching them. And in particular, which I may explore with you a little bit more, the differences and similarities in power in the public and private sector. By the way, I, there's three others I've worked with, and all three have been to our house and I know well. And one of those is Barack Obama, another one is Joe Biden, and a third one that I'd like to throw in there for some reasons that are interesting is Muhammad Ali. And, and I know all three very well. By the way, I'm hosting an event for President Biden next week. So here's what I'd say you know, great universities like Stanford, they teach you about being conscientious, doing your homework and paying attention, being analytical and having rigor and learning material. But that's just a small segment of the the leadership toolkit. Each of these people I've worked with, and I think I'd love to focus on Obama and Schwarzenegger because you could not find two more different people. Barack Obama... Harvard Law School, head of the law review, perhaps one of the most charismatic people I've ever met in my life, compelling, persuasive. I also spent a lot of time with Bill Clinton, Rhodes Scholar, one of the world's great public speakers. I've got a great story about him to share. And then you get to Arnold Schwarzenegger, who you know, went to Santa Monica Community College, but I think is one of the great leaders of our time. The only person I know who became a seven-time world champion in a broadly practiced sport came to America and said, now I'm going to become an actor. No, not just an actor, a star. And people said, Arnold, are you kidding? We can't even understand you. Your accent is so thick. This is a true fact. The first two movies, he played superhero roles, but no one could understand him. They had to bring in an extra to dub in the English because his accent was so thick. And after going from nowhere, no acting lessons whatsoever, to the world's top box office grossing star, turned around and said, now I shall go into politics and run for governor. So in terms of excelling, rising to the top leadership power in three completely disparate fields, I don't think anybody can touch that. And you'd say, well, How did this guy from Santa Monica Community College get there? There was a great moment during the recall, and Arnold Schwar, I was standing on one side of the podium, Stanford grad, two degrees, Dianne Feinstein, the senator, Stanford degree, and we're both standing behind the bodybuilder guy from the community college. Why was that? And the answer is, in simple terms, Arnold Schwarzenegger is the single most positive person I have ever seen. 
He is relentlessly disciplined. He knows how to paint a picture, tell a story like nobody I've ever seen in my life. And I know an awful lot of Stanford types, perhaps Jeffrey, even a faculty member or two might be dismissive. But that's a guy we would all be wise to do a case study of. I don't know anybody who came from less. He had an abusive alcoholic father who beat him and his brother to being one of the most successful people ever. Barack Obama did not have a, a straight line to start him. In high school, he, he nearly uh, dropped out. And I know the son of his high school principal who said he was nearly thrown out. But he obviously pulled things together, learned a lot, lost some painful election in his early career, never gave up, was willing to take risks, won a long shot battle for the presidency. For your listeners, part of the reason I was close in the Obama circle is everyone in politics who knew anything, Jeffrey, said this election's a slam dunk. Hillary's got it locked up before it started. Why would anybody look at another candidate, especially one whose name you can't pronounce? And by the way, his middle name is Hussein, for God's sakes. But I saw he had something different that not others saw. And that is why I endorsed him so early. He was very grateful. Hillary Clinton, who I love and had done events for in our home, uh, wasn't too pleased. But I think he was the right person for the country at the right time. So leadership has a lot of facets for students out there. I'd urge you to look broadly, and it goes beyond the standard pedigree. And you've emphasized, I think, two qualities that I've seen in many, many, many successful people, which is this determination and ambition. And also, you know, everybody has setbacks. Obama lost an election. Mayor Willie Brown, who I'm sure you also know, uh, who was the longest serving speaker of the California Assembly, lost his first race for the California Assembly, lost his first race for the speakership. So this ability to keep going and not let setbacks completely derail you is a quality, I think, that all of the people you have talked about really exemplify. Yeah. No, it's not just persistence and determination. It is insane determination. It is the willingness to sit in a small room hour after hour calling people begging for money and to go out the next day and have people beat the living shit out of you in the public and your family. The, uh, my <laughs> opponent for the, the gubernatorial race uh, not only ran hit ads on me, but managed to get my wife and uh, two and three-year-old children into the, the hit pieces. Uh, it's not easy. Winston Churchill once said, in war, you can only die once. But in political life, you can die many times over again. And it's true. It's hard. It's tough. It's brutal. I tell my classes this. I get to the end and say, occasionally someone raises their hand and said, why the hell would I do this? And I said, you shouldn't unless you're ready for your appointment with destiny and you really care about changing the world. A lot of them would rather be consultants, make a lot of money, join the golf club and call it a day. I think that's a shame. We need to be encouraging more of our best and brightest to be willing to, quoting Teddy Roosevelt's favorite in the ring speech, get into the ring. Be in the arena. Be in the arena. And, and I have to say to people, God, how do you feel about you, you lost that race for governor? And it's like, look, I won the race for state controller. I was the chief financial officer for the world's fifth largest economy. That's not bad. And my mind, did I really lose? I got the living crap beat out of me. It was horrendously hard on my family. It was a grind you couldn't believe. And I put in multiple millions of my own money and lost it all. The flip side is I learned more about myself than anything I've ever done. I built a global network of friends and supporters that changed my life forever. It's getting to know people like Muhammad Ali and Arnold Schwarzenegger. And I mention those too, because they're athletes that transcended sports in a way that almost no others ever will. It was to me, probably the greatest return on investment I've ever made, including my Tesla and eBay investments, which weren't bad. And I would do it again in, a, in an instant. There's this whole issue, Kipling talked about it, winning and losing 
you know, in our fallow world, people tend to think are exact opposites, but I think they're more similar than people think. There's a lot of things you can learn from both. That's a great answer. Talk about your time at eBay and what you learned from watching Meg Whitman. And particularly, I know you told me a story once about how, well, let me back up a minute. CEOs often get fired. To, uh, CEO tenure is down from what it used to be. I think Meg Whitman did an, an extraordinary job, not only building eBay, but also keeping her job as a woman in a field that didn't at that time have a ton of women CEOs. What did you learn from watching her about the dynamics of power? Yeah, so look, I, I like Meg a lot. I actually helped hire Meg. I was there uh, well before her. Just before we get to Meg, a lot of people forget founder Pierre Omidyar, and I think he was really the person who not only founded the company, had the ideas, was the original entrepreneur, but Pierre literally created the whole area, not only of online commerce, but of social media, because what made eBay different than anything else in the world was that you needed to be public in everything you did and you needed to have a reputation. And eBay was the first one to capture reputation points and measure them online. Jeff Skoll was the first CEO, incredible intellect. I give those guys tons of credit because everybody says, well, eBay won because they're the first online auction house. Not true at all. There were literally uh, over a dozen competitors, many, one of which uh, on sale was funded by Kleiner Perkins, had a big lead on us. But eBay was the best because these two guys had thought through the culture of the eBay community and built a real community before they'd really even launched the site. It was stunning. And by the way, for the record books, and I think MBA should pay attention to this one, especially entrepreneurs, eBay was profitable every month, not just every year, every quarter, every month in its existence from the beginning. There's a lot of young people now that think someone has to give you 10 or 20 or $100 million to get to profitability. Not so. eBay had one of the most perfect business models ever seen, over 92% gross margins. And it is a surprise to some people, but the initial eBay investment, roughly $6.25 million from Benchmark, we returned in less than 36 months at a 1,000x return on investment, not 1,000%. That's chump change. 1,000x return because in the IPO, they were able to sell their portion for $6.25 billion. That's pretty good. Thank you, by the way, for that context. But as you watch Meg, for instance, manage the board and manage her investors and manage her constituents, what lessons do you have in terms of how she was able to be so successful and keep her job? Yeah, look, I think there are three things. I mean, one of them, it's where I was starting. Pierre and Jeff really handed the keys to a rocket ship to her. It was the first thing with a community growing like crazy. That was, you know, there's always a little bit of good luck and a long-term success. Second, look, Meg's just very smart. She, the Princeton grad, she was an athlete. She was driven, degree from Harvard, background at Disney. She was smart. She was experienced. And third, I would say she's just a great communicator. And I think she worked hard at, at listening. She had a lot of superb traits. Mm. Okay, that's a good. And now I'll ask you a question that you may or may not choose to answer, but to, you know, you are working hard on the Biden campaign, as you know, because you are a smart man and you read the media, that there has been a lot of discussion about the Biden campaign and about Biden's chances against Donald Trump. And I think there's a lot of concern on the part of people who don't want to see Trump get reelected that the Biden campaign and Joe himself are not really necessarily up to the task. I would love your comments because I'm sure you're giving him advice and I'm sure you are reading the same things that everybody else is reading. How do you see the prospects for Biden and how do you see him being able to overcome some of the things that are causing him difficulty? Yeah. So first, in every presidential campaign, it's really the exception that someone comes into these re-election things with high numbers. Barack Obama, now we look back and say, my God, 
the most charismatic president we've had in decades, articulate, passed national health care after presidents had worked on it for a hundred years, built alliances abroad, won a Nobel Prize. The guy was amazing. His reelection numbers were in the dumper when he ran. And a lot of people, frankly, didn't like that he was a Democrat. Some people didn't like he was African American. Some people didn't like his wife. And on it goes. This is a tough job. There's no one who, who skates through these things. And then we come to, to Joe Biden, and everybody said, well, he doesn't have a chance. He's too old. He cleared the field in the primary last time within a matter of months. He won by a rather convincing electoral majority in every analyst's mind, except for Mr. Trump, who's just a world-class sore loser. He did pretty well. Then we come to the midterm election, and everybody said, well, he's too old, and you know, he's not vibrant enough, and he misstates things sometimes, and the Democrats are for sure going to lose. And they had the best midterm election congressional showing in decades. And now we come to the present. And the reality is, as Joe himself says, it's not him versus the almighty, it's him versus the other guy. And in this case, the other guy happens to be Donald Trump with four indictments, 92 legal claims against him. That guy's got a lot to deal with. So do I wish Biden was more ahead in the polls? I do. I think a lot of it has to do, frankly, with his age. But ultimately, having been through a lot of elections, people are going to be looking at, how's the economy doing? Am I better off than I was four years ago? And the fact is, economy is doing better. Unemployment is at a historic low. Inflation's going down. Jobs are up. And the market's up. So I think you combine that with historic legislation I think Joe will be just fine. But again, remember the arena speech. Loads of people love to sit on the sidelines and say whoever's running is a creep. They certainly said that about me and my opponent. (laughs) It's tougher than it looks. Take my word for it. Well, thank you for that. The differences between the public and private sector, as I hear you talk, I think there aren't many. Because the qualities of leadership that you've talked about, the ability to communicate, the ability, obviously, to be smart, the ability to be hungry for success, I think really makes the public and private sector leadership qualities more similar than many people think. Would you agree with that? I would in two ways, and I'd just like to refine it a little bit. Both private sector and public sector require you to be not just a good communicator, but a great communicator. And I think the best leaders in the public and the private sector are people who are not only great communicators, they have the rarest of all personal traits, and that's the ability to inspire people. Tenacity in both sectors, it is tough. You've got board issues, you've got employee issues and legal issues and labor issues and politics, you got all the issues. You have to be incredibly tenacious. But in the public sector, it's different in two ways. One, no one can accomplish more than the president of the United States. You can accomplish more as the Speaker of the House if you're an Nancy Pelosi and you have the right tools or the president of the United States. Second, when you get brutalized, you're not on page three of the Wall Street Journal. You're the lead news in every TV station in the country or the world when you're in public office. You're just much more out there. It requires more toughness, more fortitude. It's the toughest thing in the world with the most upside. In financial terms, you're a high beta stock, and you better uh, buckle up and be ready for it. But if you really want to make a difference, run for office. I love that. That's a good way to close. And by the way, I hope that you will run for office again. California, as you know, has many, many challenges. And I can think of no person who would be better than being governor of California than Steve Wesley. This has been the Pfeffer on Power podcast, where every other week we talk to an accomplished individual about their path to power and the practical lessons for you. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to the podcast on any of your favorite sources and buy my most recent book on power, Seven Rules of Power. Connect with me on LinkedIn, Twitter, which is I now guess called X, and jeffreypfeffer.com. Thank you so, so much, Steve, for being with us tonight. Pfeffer on Power is a production of Stanford and University FM. 
Great. Can we talk royalties? This has been the Pfeffer on Power podcast, where every other week we talk to an accomplished individual about their path to power and the practical lessons for you. If you enjoyed the episode, please subscribe to the podcast on any of your favorite sources and buy my most recent book on power, Seven Rules of Power. Connect with me on LinkedIn, Twitter, and jeffreypfeffer.com. Pfeffer on Power is a production of Stanford University and University FM.